Well, welcome again, everybody, to our Soapbox Online Church. Uh, today, my wife Janet and I are going to be talking about marriage, um, sharing a little bit about our marriage, but also bringing out the principles in the Bible that talks about marriage. Uh, it is a subject that we should talk about, and I think in some churches, it's almost regarded as not right to talk about marriage, but uh, I think we should because, um, you know, our marriages should be as good as they possibly can before the Lord. So we're going to have a little bit of a question and answer session uh, with Janet and I that hopefully you'll find helpful. So we've been married for about 34 years, coming up in March, uh, not as long as some others, but not a bad trot. So Janet, why did you want to get married? And what attracted you to me? Um, I think everyone wants to get married and, and have children. So that was always my desire. Um, I was in the church. I'd been in the church for five or six or ten years by then. And I was looking for someone in the Lord because I knew that was right. Um, yeah, then what did I like about you? <laughs> you had an English background, which is like my dad. So I liked someone like my dad. Um, you had this great sort of eyebrow wink and <laughs> blue eyes and, and a very jovial friendly character so, <laughs> yeah so funny. there needs to be a chemistry doesn't there like th there's no point in just getting married because all your friends are getting married or your mother thinks you should marry somebody I think there needs to be a, a chemistry there needs to be an attraction um, for me Obviously, there was an attraction, a physical attraction, but also Janet had been in the church for a long time, so she would proved her commitment. And, of course, you want to marry someone who can be a committed person, not you know marry you one day and then decide to go off with someone else the next. And it reminds me of the story of Jacob in the Bible. We read about it in Genesis chapter 29, verse 20. And it says Jacob served seven years. Uh, we were only engaged, I think, about 18 months. But Jacob waited seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had to her. And I've got to admit, I can't still get my head quite around that. Because, you know, if you would sort of think if you love someone, oh, wow, having to wait to marry them, is going to drag and be slow. It's going to be frustrating. But for Jacob, it seemed a quick time. And I think, you know, Jacob had a lot of problems, but I think this wasn't one of them. He was a committed person. And I think it shows the difference between love and lust. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But there is a big difference between the two. Uh, as well, Proverbs 19 verse 14 says, Houses and wealth are a heritage from fathers, but a wife with good sense is from the Lord. And, you know, as a man, you're looking for a wife from the Lord. And for me, before I got married, I just put it to the Lord because I was actually scared of girls. Uh, if it wasn't for Janet sort of um, basically asking me out, I would have been too scared. So I just put it before the Lord. Lord, if you want me to be married, you sort it out. It's your will. And, you know, when we become a Christian, that's what we do we become his servant. And so we, we should leave it, that up to the Lord. You don't need to strive about it. So Janet, I recall when we got married, we listened a lot to an American child psychologist called James Dobson. He's a, a good Christian gentleman. And he did a lot of radio programs talking about marriage, talking about children. And one of the things that he said about marriage is that you have to work on it. And I remember at the time thinking, what? You don't have to work at it. You're in love. You know, it's easy. But of course, as time goes on, do you think that in fact working on it in marriage is something that you have to do? Yes, definitely. It's, um, yeah, we both have to work at it. It's like two people that are complete strangers, really, when you first marry. Mm. Um, communication in a mature manner is just essential in marriage because there's a lot of things to discuss in marriage. There's always something mm. different. Um, and 
I don't think any relationship can grow without work. Um, what helped us, I feel, was we, we went away even from the children, left the children with the with my parents. We had some business trips mm. together and um, times away that was special. Mm. Plus, of course, we were in the church together, so we had, what, three or four meetings a week. Mm. Um, we'd go together, we'd hear together, you know, hear and learn a lot together. That, mm. So we had that in common, which is not 100% mm. of our life, really. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And you've got to remember, you know, everyone is flesh, and the flesh gets in the way of good things. You know, it can destroy, you know, like the Bible says, the devil, which we know is, is just personification of our, our own sinful desire, but the devil has come to destroy, right? And it doesn't matter how much you start off in love, you can lose that love. And even as Christians, you know, Jesus said to the church in Ephesians in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, he says, you know, you've done this and you've done that, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And Paul writes to the Galatian Christians in Galatians 5, he says, you did run well. You did run well. Who did hinder you? So again, here's a church. They started well, but the old flesh got in the way. And I, I heard a good saying a number of years ago, which went like this. It says marriage, marriage is about falling in love over and over again with the same person. And I think that's quite good because, you know, you're going to find there's going to be offenses. You're going to think, oh, this person I used to love, I now don't. You're going to have to be constantly rekindling that. that, that that's a part of what the flesh is trying to do against us. So, Janet, every so often we actually ask ourselves to rate our marriage on a scale of one to ten, uh, one being the worst, ten being the best. And recently, we sort of agreed on a on a number eight. On a number eight, tell us why, or tell our our listeners why we chose eight. Oh, we're nearly perfect <laughs> after, after thirty three years, yeah. but um, we could always improve. Um, I really, I but I think the thing is, I've learned to accept you for the way you are, and yeah, try and bring the best out of you. And God's working on me. So that's a big thing. And yeah. um, I think marriage definitely shapes you. Um, it's it's how God works, I think. You know, you've, yeah, you've got to succumb. Well, I've got to sort of succumb to you. You've got to succumb to me. And um, we shape each other, mm. don't we? Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, if you're scoring an eight, that's not too bad. Um I don't think any marriage is ever going to score a 10. If you do, I think you're kidding yourself because we're all flesh. There's always room to improve in a marriage or, or as Christians. And that's why, you know, Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, he says to the church there, grow in grace. You know, as Christians, we're never going to get 10 out of 10 in grace. We need to constantly be growing. And in a marriage, um, I think that's that's the same. So how closely linked to our relationship with God as Christians do you see marriage being? Oh, yeah, very close. If we can't be a good husband or wife, then the same principles apply to whether we can be a good servant of Christ. Mm. Yeah, I. Um, we're both a work in progress. Thankfully, God is always right and he guides us in his word um yeah definitely yeah as we're trying to grow in god we're trying to grow our relationship together as well mm. and um we have that poster above our bed that sort of says um instead of looking at each other we're looking in the same direction and thankfully it's god that's our direction mm. so, yeah definitely yeah, it is sad, you know, when you see Christians who are married and their marriage isn't so good. Often it involves the man who's a bit of a dictator. And I, I truly do believe, as, as Janet mentioned, you know, if you're not being a good husband and a good wife, it, it's almost impossible to be a good Christian because the same principles apply. And I'm, I'm going to read to you 
from Ephesians 5. This is, you know, one of those key scriptures which deals with marriage. And it says from verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Okay, so if you left it there, the old husbands, as they you know sometimes do, say, right, you just got to listen to everything um, that, that I say. But it goes on. It says, then husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. So I'm not going to read all the rest. Um, I'll just finish off um, where it gets to verse 32. It says, this is a great mystery. Um, bear in mind when the Bible uses the word mystery, it's not the way we would do it. We, we treat a mystery as something unknown. Um, in the Greek, the word mys mysterion means something that was unknown that has been revealed. Okay, so what Paul is saying, this is something that was a mystery. It's now been revealed. I speak concerning Christ and the church. So when he's talking about these principles of wives and husbands, he's making it clear these are principles that revolve around Christ and the church. So I'm going to reiterate, all of us who are Christians, whether we're male or female, we are a part of the bride of Christ. Therefore, just like a wife, we are supposed to be submitting to our head, submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. And those of us who are husbands, just as Christ loves the church, is the way we are to love our wives. And notice it says there that Christ loved it and was prepared to give his life for it. So I'd, I'd say to the ladies, if you're seeking to choose a husband, make sure you choose a husband that is prepared to give his life for you because that's the way a Christian husband should love his wife. Now, you could ask your boyfriend, fiance, prospective husband, would you give your life for me? And he's going to want to marry you. He's going to say, of course I would. Of course I would, darling. And that's okay in word. But how does he treat you in action? Because that's, that's the telltale thing. If he's rude to you, offhand to you, critical of you, then he's not going to give his life for you. But if he's doing everything he can to look after you, to encourage you, then that's a man who is going to give his life for you. So, Janet, uh, when you get married, often, often children come along. Uh, we had four children. How did having children change or enhance or complicate or, in fact, make marriage life harder? Mm, um, definitely not the same. Um, you know, we don't didn't have the time for each other like we like we did. <laughs> yeah, without children, um, and we had to organise all these little beings to fit in with our lives. There's a lot more chores. We were both tired. Of, um, our interests um, were divided a little bit because I was. The bulk of my time was spent, we were we homeschooled as well, so the bulk of my time was spent um, either teaching them or going out to little group outings and things. Um, so it's a very busy time with the children. Mm -hmm. um, you're always there, so at least you're you know, great support to be home. And in the early days, you were there unemployed, weren't you? So mm -hmm. it helped, helped with those uh, younger days when the kids were very young. Mm -hmm. That was a big help, but... Um, yeah, what was what was good about though having the children? We'd already talked about it beforehand. I think the homeschooling came when our first boy was mm. only two. Mm -hmm. um, a bit later. And um, yeah, we so we both agreed on the homeschooling, um, which is a good thing, and we wanted to do it God's way. Um, we also discussed it so much that oh, we both had the same first name for our first boy. Um, yeah, so that was good. We yeah. yeah, we were quite even and all that. Yeah. So yeah, children does change things, doesn't it? Um, 
And what you need to be aware of in marriage, our children are going to come along. They are naturally going to take a lot of energy, particularly on behalf you know, of, of the mother. Um, Janet was a stay-at-home mum. You know, the Bible says women should be keepers at home. It's, it's the biblical way. And, of course, a lot of her energy then gets spent there while I'm working. And what can happen is, you know, husbands and wives, they get diverging interests. The children grow up and leave, and now all of a sudden the husbands and wives are different people, and they separate because, you know, they, they don't know who they are anymore. So make an effort. Um, some people have date, what they call date nights, where the children, you know, go to grandma's or you get a babysitter in and the husbands and wives just go out and just have time to themselves. You know, children should not take all that time and all that love that a husband and wife should have because at the end of the day, they are the foundation of the family. And as Janet mentioned, you know, before we even got engaged, we discussed, we agreed we wanted to have quite a few children, ended up with four. Um, as Janet said, we'd even agreed on the name of the first one. Um, also important to discuss is how you are going to discipline your children. Um, we smack our children. I make no apology for that. The Bible, you know, says to do that. But I've seen even amongst Christians, Christian husbands and wives where one will agree with smacking, the other doesn't. And you have this conflict going on, you know, one parent always getting upset at the other in the way they're disciplining. And again, that can just cause for there to be separation. So talk about these things. Don't wait until you get married and you're locked in, you know, to this contract. Talk about it so that when you make a final decision to marry this person and before God, you know, you make a vow for better or for worse, right? then make sure, make sure you know all the facts before you make those decisions. So there is a difference between genders, right? Men are different from women. Um, how have you experienced this difference in marriage, Janet? Mm. Oh, and actually, by the way, um, before we got married, Janet and I had decided that um, all the big decisions would be mine and all the little decisions would be Janet's. Has that, has that played out well? Oh, beautifully, yeah. Been no big decisions yet. <laughs> so coming back to the gender issue, um, how, how have you sort of observed that playing out in marriage and the differences between a, a man and a woman? Oh, definitely. The man is tougher and stronger and more practical. I'm more emotional. And I just use my heart more than my head, head knowledge. Um, then there's the verse in Genesis 3.16, where it says, He said to the woman, I will greatly increase your sorrow in your conception. You shall bear sons and sorrow, and your desire shall be toward your husband, and he shall rule over you. Um, I think it's quite sad because there's a lot of women, husbands and wives, that the woman won't admit that they need the love and support of their husband, so they try to be the man, the tough man themselves. But, um, yeah, to have that balance is is lovely. Um, there's a definitely a difference. Um, mm. I like to have someone to look up to and to protect me when I need it or to comfort me. Um, and I think God's made the man like that. Um, yeah, I Definitely, um, there was a case, uh, yeah, it also says, um, Proverbs 17, 25, a foolish son is the anger of the father and the sorrow of the mother that bore him. We had a case um, with our oldest son when he left home. Um, yes, I was, I was just so upset about it, and Don was angry about it. So. Mm, there was a problem. He, he didn't just leave home naturally. There was a... Mm. There was a breakdown in the relationship. So, yeah, but it made me angry, but made Janet sorrowful. And that proverb just nails it, doesn't it? Mm. You know, there's a difference. And, you know, we it, it, it sort of caused a, a conflict between us because I was angry about the situation. Janet was sorrowful. And it took us a while, didn't it, before we mm. actually realised this and could actually, 
you know, come together and share um, the hurt that was involved together. Mm. Mm. So in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 11 makes it clear that there is a divine hierarchy, if I can call it that. God is the head of Jesus. Jesus is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. Now, you've shared there, Janet, that scripture from Genesis. And of course, this was set up by God, um, this, this hierarchy, because of Eve, you know, um, disobeying and eating the fruit and giving it to Adam. So in the kingdom, there's no marriage. In the kingdom, there will be no gender difference. All will be equal. But for now, this is the way God has ordained it, that the head of woman is the man. And as you read from Genesis there, that the desire would be toward your husband. And we see, of course, in the world that the woman's live movement, when women are trying to be equal to men, um, it's, not, it's not God's way. Um, now, you see, the way, people, the way people interpret this, they say, oh, well, if, if, if a man is my head, then he's going to abuse me. It doesn't need to be like that. I know lots of good Christian marriages where the man is, is the head of the house and he loves his wife as Christ loves the church. And the wife, um, you know, knows that she, uh, her, her husband is her head. She accepts that. She loves her husband and it works beautifully. So it's only the flesh. It's only our human nature that gets in the way when we want things done um, our own way. And in Proverbs 31, um, I won't, won't read the whole proverb. There's a, there's a lot in there. But it lists all of the things that this virtuous woman, the woman who fears the Lord, does. She looks, she looks to the good of her family. She looks to the good of her husband. Um, she even considers a field and buys it. So you see, there's nothing wrong with this woman, you know, being able to transact business. There's no problem with that. You know, she she sews, um, she makes sure there's enough food for the family. And it says her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders. So, you know, her husband has, has honor. And again, you know, the woman's lib sort of attitude would read this and go, oh, gosh, all this work that the woman has to do, you know, while the man just sort of sits back in the gate there. But I want to want to make you, you, you notice what it says in verse 28. The woman is doing all of this and it says, her sons rise up and call her blessed and her husband also praises her. Now, I've got a booklet talking about biblical praise where it goes into the seven or eight different Hebrew words that are translated praise. And unfortunately, in English, we've got this word praise. But if you go back to the original Hebrew word, it's halal, from which we get hallelujah. All right, halay is the first part. Yah is the name of God. The first part, hal or, or halal, it means to make a boast. All right, so what this is saying is her husband boasts about her you see so yes the woman has to be industrious and hard working but remember you husbands you should be boasting she's not your she's not your little slave you should be boasting about her and don't forget like christ giving your life for her so there's there is a balance to this whole thing so um we're probably going to, well, we are going to break this talk up into at least a couple of sessions. So we'll have more to talk about next time as far as, you know, what if you're not married? What if you're single? Uh, what if you have a problem marriage? What if your spouse isn't a believer? Because we're talking about this as, as two Christians who, who both, you know, really want to be good Christians. Therefore, we both, you know, want to be, you know, be a good wife and a good husband, but sometimes that's not so easy. So God willing, talk about that next time. But as we finish today, I want to talk about the subject of sex. Now, sex, I don't believe, is talked about enough in Christian circles. I think sometimes we Christians, ooh, we're a bit too prudish to talk about it. And therefore, it can get left as a subject where the world teaches us about it. And we, we pick up what we know about sex from the twisted 
pornographic world. It shouldn't be like that. So without getting deeply personal about it, let's just talk about some helpful basic principles. So Janet. Hmm. Well, I definitely believed it was in, within marriage, for God's ways. Um, it's definitely a giving of self and not a selfish matter. And it takes both of us are one. I mean, the two of us are one as one in Christ's eyes. So that's a part of it. And mm. We see it God's ways. Um, it was helpful to be able to uh, read a couple of books mm. before marriage. Um, and it's a beautiful thing in God's eyes and, and for us both. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would say, you know, just like marriage is a type, and we saw that from Ephesians 5, just as marriage is a type of our relationship with Christ, you know, um, the church being the bride, Christ being being the husband, as it were, then, then the act of marriage, the sexual act of marriage, it's also a type, I believe, of the ultimate union that we shall have, because as it happens now, we are espoused. That's the biblical word. Um, engagement is, is sort of the closest we have, but not quite. But we're committed. We're espoused. We're engaged to Christ. But when he comes, the Bible says we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We shall go from being mortal to immortal. And that experience, that rapturous experience of being changed and being immortal, when we are finally joined with Christ, I believe that's what sex is, is a type is a type of. And as Janet mentioned, um, we read a couple of books written by Christians. Um, I was going to bring them today and I didn't, but I'll give you the titles. One is called The Act of Marriage, written by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Della Hay. And the other one is called Intended for Pleasure. Um, I would say they're still in print, so, so you can Google those. So just to repeat, The Act of Marriage is the first one and Intended for Pleasure. Um, and it just goes through some of the basic biology, you know, of a female and a male's bodies and about, you know, as Christians, the whole principle of how to enjoy what Janet said, God has created. I mean, God could have created that babies grow on trees, but he didn't. He created that in marriage, we have this experience, uh, which is a great experience to produce our children and to show our love towards each other so you know we don't need to apologize as christians for sex god made it but as janet said it's for marriage and of course the world typically has taken it twisted it um, and of course there's fornication there's adultery that goes on but it is it is an act of marriage and it is actually a theme of the book that we call the song of solomon um, that little book that Solomon wrote. And yeah, the funny thing is, even the Jews regard the Song of Solomon as so erotic that it is banned from young Jews reading it. Amazing, isn't it? And of course, the Song of Solomon talks about Solomon and a special love that he had. But it's also very much written, because it's inspired by God, as a type, again, of our relationship with Christ. So it's very much got a, a natural physical application between a man and a woman, but also in its ultimate sense, the relationship that we should have towards our Lord. And I just want to read one verse from there, Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 4. And this principle is actually repeated, I think, three times in the book. But it says there, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, why should you stir up or awaken love until it pleases? So there's a theme in the book in the book of um, Song of Solomon, not to awaken love until it pleases. And I think one of the things we learn from that, particularly in relation to the act of love, you know, the sexual experience, don't awaken it until the right time. In other words, don't commit fornication. You know, don't commit adultery, save it for marriage. Now, that's going to take some self-control. Um, often the desires um, for sex is strong in people, 
but that's where the spirit of God comes in because one of the uh, one of the fruit of the spirit is self control, self control. And just remember, Jacob, he loved Rachel so much he was prepared to wait for seven years. Hebrews thirteen verse four says, "Marriage is honourable and all, and the marriage bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge." So there's God saying, you know, the marriage bed, you know, basically a symbol of the act of marriage, the sex act. Um, it, it, it should be undefiled, kept in marriage. But, you know, everywhere you look today, just about every TV program you look at, uh, even in schools, uh, certainly in New Zealand, what they say now is, right, children are going to have sex, let's just give them condoms. Yeah, there's, there's no effort to say, listen, God has said... You should not have sex before you get married because, of course, in our country, no one believes in God anyway. So we're seeing the results of that, the consequences of that, which they never talk about because, you know, the act of sex is a very, it's a very emotional connecting thing, isn't it? Especially for a woman. So you end up with all these broken relationships, not to mention the sexual diseases, the unwanted pregnancies, the depression and, and all of that. You know, if we just did what God told us to do, we'd be a lot better off. And finally, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5 says, don't deny yourselves to each other. And in the context, um, Paul, inspired by God, talking to husbands and wives, is talking about having sex with each other. He says, don't deny yourselves unless you first agree to do so for a while in order to spend your time in prayer but then resume normal marital relations. In this way, you will be kept from giving in to Satan's temptation because of your lack of self-control. So what Paul is saying is, listen, you know, work this out amongst yourselves. Don't deny yourselves unless you just want to go apart and have a, a special time of prayer where you're committing yourself to the Lord and then let this, let this continue to be a part of your marriage. And you know, I know this whole subject of sex can be problematic for some people. So I would say this is something you should talk about as well before you get married. Um, read those books together so that you both understand what's going to please each other. And then apply those principles of unselfishness because it shouldn't just be something, you know, that one or other demands, okay? Marriage has to be that that sense of selflessness as we give ourselves to each other so god willing as i mentioned we'll continue um, in a part two talking about this but hopefully today we've just just covered some of the basic principles of marriage and you know there is a saying of course that prevention is better than cure if you're a young person maybe not yet married or about to get married or you haven't been married long if you can apply these principles of god before you know you have problems and before you end up getting divorced then that's always better but if you have had a problematic marriage you know it's not too late um, to apply these principles and you know be blessed by God as a result and don't forget don't forget don't lose sight of the key focus that marriage should be on and that is that it is a type right don't forget a type a foreshadow um, a symbol of your relationship as a Christian with Christ. You know, the, the marriage that we have is very temporary. It's not going to last long, but our marriage with the Lord is going to be forever. Now, I noticed there was a question come through. Um, question was, so can good Christians be necessarily good spouses? I think I've understood, read that correctly. Can good Christians necessarily be good spouses. I would say if you're a good Christian, you are almost certainly going to be a good spouse. And the reason I say that is, is because of what we talked about. Your marriage, your marriage is going to be as good as you applying the same principles that you apply to Christ as a Christian. To me, it's as simple as that. I'm a simple guy. I don't like complications. I can't understand complicated things but to me it's very simple you want good relationships with people 
You want a good marriage? Be a good Christian. Love the Lord with all your heart. And if you're doing that and sacrificing yourself, then you're going to be applying the same principle to your marriage. You're not going to be a nasty spouse if you're a faithful Christian. Yeah, so that would be my answer to that. I don't know if anybody else wanted to um, throw any questions in before we move on from there. Feel free to unmute or raise your hand. Okay, no problem. All right, so what we'll do now, we'll break bread together. Um, and of course, as Christians, remember, we are all part of the bride. We're all the bride of Christ waiting for that wonderful um, marriage that is to come. So as we break bread together, we remember Jesus' death and his resurrection. But one of the things he said was to do this until I come. So I hope, you know, when we break bread, and I think I mentioned last week, you know, do you think about maybe just one aspect of the crucifixion or the resurrection that you focus on as you break bread? Well, perhaps today, because we've talked about marriage and we are going to be married to the Lord, perhaps today as we eat the bread and drink the wine, we can just be casting our minds ahead to the time when we're going to sit down with the Lord to a wedding banquet. It's going to be a feast of fat things, the Bible says. Beautiful, well-aged wine, beautiful food. And we, we, and don't ask me how the Lord's going to do this with millions of people, but we as one, as the one bride of Christ, are going to be able to be with our Lord, who loves us so much, who gave his life for us, and just finally tell him how much we love him face to face. So maybe that can be our, our thoughts as we eat and drink. So would someone like to volunteer to give thanks for the bread and the wine? Remember, if no one volunteers, I volunteer you. It's like an inscription. Thank you, Guy. Father God, Lord, um, we thank you that in your word, Lord, you cover um, all the questions that our, our minds and hearts could ever come up with, Lord, that um, we can turn to your word, which is your inspired writings, Lord, to help us know how to be, how to act, how, how we should treat each other, Lord God. And um, one of the things that you um, tell us to be, Lord, is, is, is fellows that are in fellowship with each other, Lord God, and um, we can find it at times really easy to be fellowshipping with um, our brothers and sisters when we go to church, Lord, and when we um, come together in, in your house, Lord, and when we're at praises, praise and worship meetings, Lord, and when we're at prayer meetings and so forth, Lord. Lord, um, but when we're husband and wife, Lord God, um, and we're Christians, Lord, and we're, we're one flesh, Lord, um, we too are in fellowship, Lord God. You tell us that um, where two or three gather in your name, Lord, there you are in the midst of them, Lord. And Lord, um, it's good that you use that number two or three, um, that us as husband and wife, Lord, um, we are two. And that within our relationship, Lord, if we're putting um, your son first, seeking your kingdom, Lord, first, Lord, then you are with us permanently, Lord God, because we are um, going through our lives and through our marriage, Lord, um, by your spirit, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, that um, while being a Christian is a, is a tough thing, Lord, um, that there is some parts to it that is um, really easy, Lord, and that you help us with understanding in those areas. Lord, we thank you for your son, Lord, um, who gives us such great direction. And um, we look forward to his return, Lord, and for his rule, his reign, showing us that um, the way that you would like it, Lord, um, can be done. Um, perfectly and um, it just takes uh, your spirit Lord God that we are fully engulfed and and infused with 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 your ways Lord God so we love you both and we thank you and um, we partake in these these emblems now in, in your son's mighty name Lord amen